Claro, claro que sí. Claro que sí. Todo en español. Español, español, mexicano, español, peruano, no me importa. Chileno. Chileno, lo que sea. Oh, you're so lucky we're going to go back to English. Let's get started. Um, I have, now, correct me if I'm wrong, but are you the lead organizer for this event? Sure. I think you are, right? So, uh, so t let's start there, right? Um, they don't know how much you get paid, right? I mean, the, the stacks of cash in your hotel room, I, they've actually, never seen, right? Actually, at least three other people do know how I'm you know, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I was going to double your rate tonight, right? Just okay. at the after party, I was going to make sure you got double the pay. Awesome. Um, if you don't know, right, volunteering is zero pay, right? And so the organizers, the whole organizing team, including the lead organizer, um, don't get paid for this work. So how, who was it that got you involved and how did they trick you into being the lead organizer for WordCamp Albuquerque? Great, great question. Um, well, first off, uh, let me just deflect most of the credit. Um, the rest of the organizing team is awesome. Sam, Ray, Jamie, Elaine. Um, is Elaine here? No. Um, Elaine did so much of the legwork. Um, you know, I run a company, and so uh, just, you know, you, you got to sleep at some point. And so Elaine especially was awesome, but everyone was awesome. Um, in uh, 2016, we had a work camp in Albuquerque that uh, Karen Arnold uh, was with Automatic uh, organized. And, um, you know, my WordPress consulting business has been, was like basically a year old. And, uh, you know, we'd never gone to a word camp or been involved with a word camp and so um, you know I, I'd been going to the meetup and I offered to help out uh, so she um, uh, had me wrangle volunteers and it went well and um, you know I've known Sam for several years now and um, you know I think Sam was had a lot of the vision for what this was going to look like and I was he, he shared that vision with me and I was really excited to to support it and make it happen. That's awesome. So the, the key moral of the story is don't hang around with Sam or you might get voluntold. Uh, yeah. Um, no, but I was happy <laughs> to do it, man. It's, uh, you know, uh, I, I, you know, part of the vision was you know, to put on this, this big event to re-energize this community and, um, I mean, we'll, we'll see, I guess, but, uh, you know, oh, so far like so good. Yeah, it looks like it's worked. So you, you do this as a volunteer, right? This isn't your full-time job. Uh, you have a full-time job. You're running a company. Tell us a little about that company. Yeah, so my company is Eleven Online, um, and uh, we do software development, uh, we do WordPress work, uh, we do business solutions, software as a service, maintenance, um, and we also offer some digital marketing services. We started doing that in 2017. And um, I'm the CEO, my three partners are here, and a bunch of my people are here. Hey guys. Um, and um, yeah, we've been around for three and a half years. I've been the CEO since the uh, beginning of 2017. Um, I actually started a different firm and uh, we merged um, with the 11 online guys and so um, it's been a journey and um, yeah, not having kind of entrepreneurial experience before I decided to start a consulting business was, uh, there's a lot of learning, but um, um, it's mostly it's mostly joy. What was the event that triggered you to decide to start a company on your own? Um, I think it was not necessarily one event. It was more how dissatisfied I was um, at my old job and the paradigm there. And also maybe like decades of sort of frustration at not being able to express myself and be creative professionally. And so where that bubbled up was, uh, I, I lived in the East Coast before I came to New Mexico, and um, my, my night job um, was I would teach English as a second language. Mm -hmm. And that was the kind of primer, because um, the school I worked at, they, they didn't have lesson plans. I had to come up with my own lesson plans. Um, they didn't really have a ton of guidelines on how to teach. I was teaching adults. So... 
you know, it, it was kind of my little sandbox. Um, and that, that's where I got to be creative. And so when we came out to New Mexico, um, I knew that I wasn't going to keep doing what I was doing before. I had to do something different. And um, it was a series of accidents and stumbles meeting the right people. And um, this is where I find myself. That's awesome. When you first started, was it just you? No. Uh, it was myself. It was Jay Renteria over there. It was uh, another guy, French guy, Florian Gusson, um, that I, I, we all met at a coding boot camp. And, um, you know, when we got done with the boot camp, we, we all kind of decided, hey, let's keep working together and see what happens. Was that while you had another job? No, um, no. I so I let when we came to so, New Mexico. So you all got together, put on a single parachute, jumped off the cliff, and said, "Let's see if, if this works." That is a frightening way to describe it. But yeah, yeah. I, it was accurate, <laughs> wasn't it? I mean, I think that's what I heard. Yeah. You had no backup plan. Not really. Uh, no, not especially. I mean, I guess I could have gone back to project management type stuff, but I really didn't want to do that. Right. Yeah. So when you when you some of that first team, you're all at a coding boot camp, so were they all developers? Yeah. So you have four developers, th no three developers, no designers, no business people, no finance people. Yes. So the perfect model for just initiating yeah. a company. Yeah. Um, How was the first year? Yeah, so, okay. Um, first thing I realized, we, we were working together for a month, and I immediately realized, okay, um, I need to spend 80% of my time doing business development, or we will die. <laughs> And so um, that's what I did. I didn't have any idea. Didn't know what I was doing. I had some mentors, um, uh, Eric and Josh, who eventually became my future partners. I, they were running their own consulting business. They just started, and um, so I leaned on them. Uh, people like Sam. Uh, you know, you just start cultivating mentors, and um, so that was the first move. Yep. Um, and then you know, the kind of work we did was the kind of work where we, you know. You know, we were we were in support of you know. Um, it wasn't the kind of work where we necessarily needed a designer out of the gate, and then we started transitioning into that work. We started contracted designers, and then we we brought on a designer full time uh, in 2017. But in order to support the three of you. And you weren't all living in one house, right? You each had your own places, yes. you had your own bills, yes. right? Uh, I'm going to presume that some of you were not living with your mom. And so, Is that true? In, true. in that context, That's true. right? Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> um, in that context, you guys, you guys had a decent amount of money you had to make every single month. Yeah. Uh, which isn't just a function of work, it's also a function of collections. Y yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, you could do all the work and deliver. It, and that didn't equal money in the account. Yeah, and uh, yeah, we de we definitely had a collections problem uh, in the first year. So and what'd you do to work on that? Well, um, we we uh, we badgered. <laughs> I mean. We I didn't we didn't know much about structuring a contract properly or structuring payments properly, and um, you know the only thing I can say is we learned the hard way, um, and we had a couple of you know clients that uh, basically you know held the last payment which we structured wrong. It was a big payment for work we had already done, held it hostage um, and kept kind of moving the goalpost and stuff like that. And um, I think the big thing we learned is just how much prep is involved putting together a contract that makes sense, an estimate, a scope of work, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I have a hard time learning things um, every other way but the hard way. So. <laughs> so today your contracts look different, right? The structure, your payment structures are different. Oh, yeah. What, is, what does it look like today for the folks that are thinking about jumping out on their own? Well, we, we have different arrangements with different kinds of clients. We have sort of parts of our business that are somewhat productized so we, we have a good sense of you know the effort involved and so for those we do you know we do a, a fixed 
because we have a good sense of what, what kind of profit margins we're going to make. Um, there are clients that are on retainer um, that we, you know, we can kind of reliably depend on, you know, every month we have this much work and, you know, we work by the hour. Um, and then, you know, I think the big thing for us in, in, in 2018 is um, just thinking about uh, how we can further productize. Um, you know, I, just, I don't know, if, is Pam, Pam here? Oh, there you are. Yeah, we had a conversation last night and we were, you know, kind of both in, in you know, service, service companies and, you know, just talking about, okay, how are we going to get away from the sort of one-to-one, -one, you know, our time and, you know, revenue, right? And so, um, you know, it's something that we've been slowly trying to do and I think we're going to try and ramp that up um, in 2018 is, is, is productize and I think there's an incredible opportunity was uh, Gutenberg uh, in the WordPress space and so we'll be taking a look at that. No? <laughs> Okay. You have real-time feedback in this session, which is awesome. No, Eric just Eric just wants me to uh, be quiet. Mm -hmm. I, I, is that is that news to anyone? I mean, come on, whatever. Uh, you were not born in the U.S. No. You were born in Lima, Peru. Yes. My last name is Lemma. When I say my last name, some people think it's Lima. Oh yeah. Then sorry. they say Lima, and then they spell it L-I-M-A. I've never been to Lima, Peru, but I hate Lima, Peru. <laughs> Because it ruins my name. Yeah. That, funny, funny story relating to that um, is uh, I hate Alfonso's. <laughs> I hate Alfonso's. And uh, because everyone uh, calls me Alfonso. Alfonso. And you're like, yeah. there's no F. No, no F. And uh, I actually, uh, this past year, I met an Alfonso. And uh, I went up to him and I was like, you know that everyone calls me Alfonso. It drives me nuts. And uh, he was like, everyone calls me Alonso. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I hate Alfonso's, and um, Lima is actually uh, a really cool, interesting place. It might be a little much for um, Gringos. Sorry, for lack of a better word. Uh, it's a it's a crazy it's a crazy city. A lot of traffic, a lot of activity, um, a lot of stuff going on, uh, but. But it's really dynamic and awesome. And how long were you in Peru? So I moved to the states when I was very young, uh, I was five. But but um, you know I had lots of family there. We you know the first probably ten years we were in the states. We'd go back every summer. Yeah. And um, uh, so yeah, I mean you know I have a deep uh, affinity and connection. And there's still things that kind of you feel a little bit alien to the American culture in some ways, but... Um, sure, and you were teaching ESL, you said, when you are on the East Coast. That's right, yeah. Do you, are you, do you do anything with inclusivity or outreach here in, in Albuquerque? Yeah, so I, in, in Albuquerque, I've been teaching um, a Spanish conversation class at the library for free, just um, volunteering. I mean, the selfish reason I do it is it's an excuse to speak Spanish on a regular basis, and so... Yeah. So to preserve preserve the Spanish I have, which is very accented, and you know, when I go home, when I go to Peru, uh, people, my, my family, I'm down the, you know, el gringo. Yeah. <laughs> but but uh, but you know, so so selfishly for that, but also you know. Uh, but do you teach them different sentences? So instead of saying "Where's the bathroom?", you're like, "How do I install WordPress?" It's just the cover. I mean, because there's a whole lot you can do with that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Today I, I, class, we're gonna say right, and then yeah. like, oh, I learned WordPress uh, in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, not too much WordPress talk, but we, we just talk. It's just conversation, um, different levels. Sometimes I'll bring the paper, and we'll just talk about what's going on in the news. Um, just 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 talking. We don't we don't go over infinitives or you know do any grammar or any of that stuff. Uh, just just to, it's more for people to just start to feel comfortable. Um, 
hearing and speaking. Exactly right. Now, one of the things that's interesting to me about that is when you're teaching conversational Spanish or, or conversational any language, right? A lot of it is just getting comfortable with all the things that you that, that you're just going to hear, right? And even if you don't know an exact word, there's a there's context, and you'll just navigate through it. And it's getting comfortable with things you may or may not know. And a lot of what we see when we're teaching people WordPress is helping them get comfortable with things they don't know, right? They log in, they get to the admin screen, and they're like, what do I do here, right? Um, how has doing one of those things, right, conversational Spanish, helped you in the world of the WordPress work that you do? Yeah, that's an awesome question. Uh, I, I think just having the teaching background um, was, was critical, especially when we were starting out and we were working with small business owners and you know you know I remember when we were starting to kind of devise what is it that we're going to offer our clients right training so then we had to think like what does that mean how are we going to structure that how, how are our clients going to get value out of that um, experience and so we put a lot of thought into that uh, on how that works and I think um, you know, this is something I say in the office all the time, and they're probably sick of hearing it, but um, I'm a big fan of Dune. Fear is the mind killer. And um, whatever strategies that we need to, you know, uh, you know use to... to you know, get out of the fear mindset. Um, and for some people, uh, it's just kind of, you know, banging your head in the wall or just kind of getting through it and, and you know, pulling the bandit off uh, all at once. Or, and but, but for other people, it, it's it's a more gradual experience. And so, you know, you have to kind of. You have to you have to assess that in everyone, person to person, and and that can be tricky sometimes. But um, you know, uh, sometimes and so I'm, one of my issues sometimes I, I can intimidate people because I, I I like to talk, I like to get into the conversation, and so your, your good looks. Yeah, thanks. I mean, it's just <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, so that's something I, I think about all the time. Like, how can I how can I make it so that people don't feel like that? Um, and and. And, and teaching has given me some of those tools. That's awesome. We talked about Gutenberg. How many people in here work for an agency that builds websites for customers? Come on, guys. Okay. Raise your hands. Yeah, so a third to almost a half. Um, we talked for a second, you said you're excited about Gutenberg. Do you have a lot of sites you've worked on that you no longer have a relationship with that client? For better or worse, I don't, actually not really. Because <laughs> what strikes me is, it's one thing if you have an ongoing relationship with your customer, right? You're like, hey, heads up, there's going to be a change to the editor. And some of the things we used to write that we're using, say, ACF or some other plugin, could potentially have an issue with Gutenberg. And so we're going to get in there because we have an ongoing relationship. We're paid monthly. We have a retainer. We're going to go in and, and tweak that for you. And that's one dynamic. But the other dynamic is <laughs> we built 100 sites. We don't have any relationship with them. And it breaks. Yeah. And then who has to go back and fix? Like, is it on us? Is it on you? Do you have to tell them how to explain? And then you're like, but Gutenberg's really cool. <laughs> like, uh, in my wallet doesn't think so. And so. So as you think about the opportunity going forward for agencies and Gutenberg, right, how do you think through this whole construct of who's responsible for keeping a WordPress website still doing the thing that they paid it to do when they paid for it to do it? Yeah, I don't know if I can answer that question, but I can. Well, Matt's going to watch, okay. right? I mean, so <laughs> give him a really good answer. Yeah, I mean, what I can say is that um, you know, we, we we just had this situation happen where we had an old client that uh, didn't renew their domain. Um, you know, did, you know, didn't have a maintenance plan or retainer with us or any of that stuff, and um, you know, just kind of slipped through the cracks. And um, you know, they they sort of called us in desperation, and we fixed it. But that's different, right? Because the amount of time it takes to fix that is what two, yeah, two right. minutes. Yeah. Right. Uh, so yeah. if you have a twenty, thirty page website, several different pieces that are displayed because of ACF and all of a sudden Gutenberg breaks it, yeah, it's not going to be a two minute fix. Right? So let's just role play for a second. Okay. I'm the customer. <laughs> you built the site two, three years ago. 
whatever it was was the going rate, I paid you, mm -hmm. we're done, I've never paid anything else, and I call you up and I go, hey, the website you built, because of course I'm going to use that language, right? right? The website you built that I paid for doesn't work anymore. What are you going to do to fix it? Yeah, so... We're really, really busy right now. <laughs> no, you know, okay, so, so okay, on some level, um, you know, part of the reason that we use WordPress in a lot of our projects is to be able to hand it off to yeah. the client, right? Yeah. So that they can get stuff done. Um, but, you know, I think as part of a due diligence of an agency, you do offer people you know, a, a low cost or reasonably reasonable cost service to where they can feel comfortable in case anything were to happen, hey, we're there. And, you know, it's not as if um, we haven't been offering that basically since we started, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, so, you know, on some level, like, you know, our maintenance plans and retainers and stuff like that, it's not just an upsell. It's not just, right. you know, it's not just like, a, um, you know, we're trying to, you know, extract a little bit more money from you. Um, it's, it's, because, it's there for this very reason. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and so, you know... We, we want to help out our customers. Yep. You, know, we, you know, we want to help out our customers. We want to keep good relationships. And I think it has to be one of those kind of case-by-case -case basis things. If I so would you recommend for other agencies that they start prepping their clients for retainers or maintenance contracts now before May or June or whenever? Yeah, I, I, think, I, think it's a, I think it's a great idea. But, I mean, I think maybe a larger issue than that is that... Um, Use the existing best practices so that uh, you know the, the sites that you build last for a long time. And I, I think you know, and that's not to talk trash on any other agency or anything like that. But I know that there are a lot of providers that don't really participate in the community and don't really adhere to those kind of best practices. And for them, WordPress is like a way to do a slapdash sort of job. Yeah. And so I would encourage people to do their research on their providers um, so that they don't kind of engage in those uh, business relationships. Yeah, no, that totally makes sense. Which, in terms of advice for agencies and in the room, right, would also be uh, just creating for, for pr prospects kind of an information sheet as something that says, here's how to evaluate agencies, just so that you know going ahead, right? We're doing a whole marketing campaign around that. Yeah, that's right. In, in 2018, so, yeah. Well, I didn't mean to put your business out on the street. I mean, no, that's all good. Generic strategy, not the specific one you're yeah. doing. Right. Can you go to more detail on that? Yeah, <laughs> let's go into detail. John wants to know. Later, John. <laughs> Right. So we have Gutenberg coming up, and that's going to mean a lot of different things for, for agencies and for customers. Um, but there's also just the broader question, uh, whether it's the, the, the how you design stuff with um, Gutenberg or how you design it with page builders. You have a whole bunch of page builders out now, which uh, some developers and agencies are pro, some are against. You have people using ACF and other tools that are not page builders to display stuff on with the total number of different ways that developers can create a visual output, right? Um, what's the best way for, for a new developer coming on the scene to figure out how to choose which, right? How do they know which one? It, well, you talked about developers should use a best practice, something that lasts forever, and they go, yeah, but the new developer comes in and goes, well, I can output it with ACF, I can output it with uh, Beaver Builder, Elementor, or something else, or I can start playing with the Gutenberg plugin. Like, so how, how, what do you recommend? Uh, for a new developer, I'd say first off, what are what are your goals um, in business, right? What what what, is, what kind of business are you trying to build, right? Um, and I think that's going to factor, you know, heavily into whatever decision it is you make on your stack. I think the second thing is, um, I bet on I bet on Gutenberg, and I bet on Gutenberg making a big impact, um, and. Um, I think that I think it would be smart to start really taking a look at that and really thinking about um, 
how they can create, how they can use Gutenberg to create a better product for their clients. I, you know, we, I, I don't necessarily know that we've made like this enormous bet on it in some way, um, at least not yet, but I think it's, it's probably as the safest bet, in my opinion. Got it. You talked about productizing your services. Do you think you'll productize something around Gutenberg? <laughs> yeah. This whole team <laughs> Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I think it's, this isn't, it's like, I guess, this, sorry, Eric, this is not a nuclear secret. I mean, I, I, I mean, do you, I, you know, feel, do you feel? Do you guys feel like his team gave him talking points? <laughs> right? No, they like, just don't like it when I start shooting off at the mouth. <laughs> uh, so, you know, look, I've said this a couple of times. Um, you know, with things like Gutenberg or other things, t technology, you, you hear a lot of arguing, consternation, anger, um, and I'm more focused on thinking about, okay, how do we need to adapt? How is it that we can take advantage, capitalize, you know, as a, as a business owner? Yeah, I don't, I just, I don't, you can't get caught up in all that stuff. I think you have to think, okay, how are we going to be dynamic and, and take advantage of the situation? Um, so, so that's what, you know, that's, that's our mindset. So it strikes me that one of the themes throughout this conversation is the fact that you don't have a fear bone in your body. And so you're like, let's just start a company from scratch with no backup plan and we'll just figure it out. Or let's just jump into the new Gutenberg and who knows, right? But I don't, like, like there's a whole lot of people that have a lot of, of anxiety about, well, what if we fail, right? And that what if we fail holds them back in a way that you're just more free to say, yeah, there, that's always going to be a possibility. Let's just charge forward and take the ground, right? And that gives you that freedom to drive forward. How do you help the people that are less naturally able to do that and yet still need to do it? You know what I mean? They still yeah. need to take a step forward. How can you come alongside them and help them? What advice do you have for them? Well, let me, let me clarify. <laughs> I, I, I have lots of fear and anxiety. I, I just think that I have over the course of the last several years built up an infrastructure emotionally to be able to come to terms with it and deal with it. Um, you know, and and I never this this endeavor is something very, very re really new to me. Um, in that I I didn't come from a family of entrepreneurs. Um, my family is mostly professionals, uh, you know, white collar, right, and and steady, stable jobs, academics, stuff like that, and so. Um, this is this is all like I, I wouldn't. Have you you started a company. Yeah. You sold that company and merged with another. Well, we merged. Merged. Yeah. You took over the CEO role of the merged entity. You're talking about prioritizing services and you're talking about fully embracing Gutenberg, right? If you walked into a physician's office and started talking about all the things you've done, they'd be like, you're a candidate for a heart attack, right? I mean, <laughs> none of these things are like casual. You did five of them, right? And okay. so I'm just saying, look, you're going to be surrounded by other people who don't have the, let's just do it attitude, right? So how do you come alongside them and say, I understand that this is, like you've developed some internal wherewithal, strength, courage, support systems to take the next step. How do you help and, and how do you encourage people who are just nervous to take that next step? Okay, so um, the coding boot camp that I went to, um, I, I go every cohort they have, I, I go and talk to them. Um, and uh, you know, I think I think a big part of my message is trying to kind of put put it in their brains that they actually do have a little bit more control and power over the way things can go in their lives than they think. Um, you know, and that and part of that is effort and, and really and, and hard work and making sacrifices because I, I've had to do that. Yeah. Um, I can't live the same life I lived in my twenties, okay. um, and so you know, that, I, you know, 
you know, I, I, telling my story. You know, um, I, I, I was a sort of victim of my own inertia and sort of satisfaction, low expectation satisfaction in my job um, until I started hating it. You know, um, and so. I got kind of lucky and fell into a couple things, and before you know it, I got into the situation. So, um, it, it's 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 very it's it's doable. It's but it's hard. Yeah. It's so hard, and if you're not willing to make the sacrifices and put in the effort, you got no chance. You you, you could be the smartest person in the world. You got no chance. That's fair. Well, we got a couple minutes for a question or two from you guys. Anyone have a question for Alonzo? Alfonso. I mean Alonzo. <laughs> Uh, team, you don't have a question for me? Do you go to one tomorrow? Ah. Yes. <laughs> Isn't that what he always says? Yeah. Take yeah. the Eagles. Tell me more about your Gutenberg product. <laughs> <laughs> when's, when's it launching? <laughs> nah. How about your 2018 marketing plan? Uh, <laughs> later, John. <laughs> yeah. Are there any questions you will answer? What's that? Are there any questions you will answer? Um... Eagles and the points. <laughs> yes. Uh, you and I had a conversation the other day about the new office and the work structure of your agency. They have yeah. a new office too? Well, no, we. So, yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I can talk about that. We, yeah, so, beginning of the year, we made, you know, so we were, last year, we were asking, so all of our people in Albuquerque, Santa Fe area, we were asking people to come in to work. Uh, twice a week uh, to to an office, and your employees only work two days a week. Yeah, that's a got a really good deal. <laughs> tell, tell, yeah, I'm going to try and steal your guys. Um, but we were asking them to come into the office two days a week, um, and so beginning of this year we decided to make it 100% optional. We work from home if you want. So we we moved to a smaller office, you know, kind of accommodating people that don't have the best sort of work from home situation. Yeah. And then let me take meetings with some of our local clients and, and stuff like that. But so yeah, we, we that was a, that's a big transition. I mean, we, we worked from home for part time, so it, I, I, we have an infrastructure. It's in our DNA, but um, it's definitely a big move. I, you know, we're we're trying it out and seeing what happens. I'll let you know more. <laughs> awesome. Let's give it up for Alonzo. Thank you, guys. I'll take it. Take a couple minute break and then we'll be back at it.